Hello everyone, so welcome to a presentation on computer vision and natural language processing, specifically the intersection of these two subfields within machine learning, uh, and the presentations by me, Zarif, and Sachin. So a, a couple quick notes before we get going. Um, we will be providing a link at the end of this video or presentation um, to a doc with some further resources and some further reading. So those include the sources for this presentation and also just some more papers uh, and articles and a couple GitHub repos that we think would be really helpful if you're interested uh, in diving more into this topic here. Uh, and there's a lot more reading that you can do because uh, obviously we can't cover uh, every single little detail within our presentation. And also if you have any questions, uh, if you're watching this live uh, kind of during the club time, then feel free to just type in the chat or turn on your mic and ask, or you can always contact me or Sachin uh, with any questions about anything in the presentation. All right, so with that out of the way, let's go ahead and get started. A little bit of an intro, first of all. You've got computer vision as one subfield of machine learning, and computer vision, I think most of you probably know what it is, but it just includes uh, using machine learning techniques to look at largely images and try to visually understand the world. So some examples of that include uh, object detection for self-driving cars and then diagnosis based off of uh, x-rays. And then you've also got natural language processing, yet another pretty big subfield of machine learning. And that is, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's applying machine learning techniques to languages. And so languages, when you come down to representing that for a machine learning algorithm, it's really a sequence of numbers. So you can think of natural language processing as just using machine learning algorithms for representing and working with human languages and even non-human languages like DNA and RNA, but that's a topic for another day. So these techniques can really be combined. The, all the techniques that encompass computer vision and natural language processing, these fields and these techniques can actually be put together for some pretty amazing and interesting systems. And so today we're gonna to be looking at this subfield, uh, really the combination of, con of computer vision and, and NLP. And we'll be looking at four specific uh, use cases and some examples for how those use cases actually work. Go onto the topic of lip reading. So what is lip reading? Lip reading enables one to react to any person by analyzing the voice sounds, motions, and expressions while looking at their lips, right? So basically, lip reading allows you to listen, basically, or, you know, allows you to have a third ear um, by watching a speaker's face to figure out their speech patterns and gestures, right? So to effectively lip read, you're going to be learning to use the cues provided by the movements of the speaker's mouth, teeth, and tongue. And basically, you're going to be using your vision or your eyes to basically assist with learning because your eyes are going to be reading the lips. Um, some facts about lip reading, you know, it's impossible to lip read in the dark because you need to have that clear light for your eyes in order to see those lips. And obviously, you must have very, very good eyesight to see those, you know, small changes in those lips in order to pick up on the correct visual cues. So, you know, lip reading is mostly used by deaf people because, you know, they can't understand, they can't hear um, normal speech. So lip reading is a way of understanding, you know, words said by speech or by voice. And um, yeah, I just want to talk more about the vasemes, which are basically, you know, the lip gestures that make up the alphabet of nonverbal communication, right? So, so basically, as um, shown in the next slide, you're going to see that these seams, uh, there's not really a one-to-one -one correlation, right? There's not, I mean, in the alphabet, you have A, B, C to Z. Um, that's not the case in these seams, right? Like, for example, P and B could be mixed up. You're going to be seeing in the next slide um, that for P and B, you know, they might have the same sound or same movements with their uh, facial expressions, right? What I'm basically trying to say is that, you know, these vasemes just show that multiple sounds can have the same shape. Now, you may be asking, you know, if two of the same sounds have that kind of same, you know, two different sounds, I'm sorry, had the same facial, you know, expression, how are you going to differentiate or how are people who want to lip read differentiate between those, you know, different um, sounds? 
And that's basically what where the machines come in, right? So, you know, let's see how the machines do it. So, machines have actually, you know, come far in machine learning, right? So, there's going to be three uh, different types of approaches that were used for lip reading, okay? So, uh, I only put one here, but I'm going to talk about all three. But I'm only going to go, you know, more in depth, so let's put that for last. But for first, we have the automated speech recognition. And basically, what's that trying to do is it's just trying to understand, you know, what's being spoken by audio, right? So that doesn't have to do with lip reading. It's just, you know, trying to understand what the person's saying by audio. So it has nothing to do with the um, facial expressions, but it has to do more with the audio sentiments, right? Furthermore, we have the audio visually automated speech recognition. Um, that's using both audio and visual clues. So basically just an enhanced version of the automated speech recognition or ASR. Um, and the ALR, which I'm going to be talking about next, is just using both facial expressions and audio sentiments to understand what is being spoken. Um, or to understand you know, what is being said. So now I want to go into the ALR or the automated lip reading, which is what we're going to be talking about because it's directly correlated with our presentation. So... ALR or automated lip reading is basically, you know, just what it's trying to be said based on the visual cues or the video, right? And so basically, you know, ALR in this early stages, when combined with computer vision and NLP or natural language processing models, it was just to focus on, you know, finding the alphabet or digit recognition. So basically that the seams, you know, it's going to try to find that P or B or, you know, those types of letters. And then as, you know, successful stages of the alphabet recognition, you know, came on, if, you know, it went more into word and sentence, sentence recognition, right? Because it's trying to find the whole sentence instead of just trying to find each letter and piecing those letters together. So basically, uh, I just want to go into my next uh, point, which is, you know, the structure that ALR has been composed in, you know, in many current models. Right. So first we have the localization of the lips or lip localization. Then we take or extract the visual features from that whole image and then we classify it into that the seam or that facial expression to which we can associate that with any of the seam. Right. So basically, you know, that first um that first kind of lip localization is associated with computer vision, right? Because then you have the uh, feature extraction or the extraction of visual features, which also has, you know, it's associated with computer vision. And then finally, you have that classification block to classify it into, you know, its specific vaccine. And, you know, while it's trying to make sure that speech unit is with that complete decoded message, that's going to be in the domain of the natural language processing model. And then you can see from the next point, um, CNNs or convolutional neural networks, as many of you may know, have already, you know, just elevated the game or elevated, you know, research by combining that or by, by combining CNNs with, you know, convol uh, computer vision slash NLPs. So I just wanted to, you know, redirect your image to the top left corner, um, which is, you know, just showing you the lip localization, feature extraction and classification, basically, you know, the basic ALR structure. And you can, you can see the input video, which will be put in, and then the decoded speech or the seams indicated will be outputted. And then I want to redirect your attention to the top right, which is, you know, just showing some models. Elipnet is actually a model that has been created by researchers or machine learning researchers that, um, you know, have basically, you know, just developed a model or ALR model to, um, you know, read lips. And that's an example of, you know, the ALR or Elipnet doing its thing. And then at the bottom, we have, you know, the CNNs incorporated with the CV slash NLP models. So to talk a little bit more about that, you can have the CNN actually do the localization and feature attraction. And then basically you can feed that in. Uh, I mean, obviously after CNN goes on to do its thing, um, the last layer will be consisting of the long short term memory. Uh, just to do the final classification by taking, you know, the individual frame outputs into account. And there's obviously other, you know, deep learning features that you can use. Um, but CNNs and LSTMs, you know, were basically one of the top two basic kind of, um, you know, models per se to 
uh, do this. And basically, you know, as scientists are going on, uh, they're working on that base of CNN with LT uh, LSTM along with the CV slash NLP. So that's basically it for lip reading. Thank you, guys. Okay, great. So that was a lot about lip reading. So now let's dive into our second uh, out of four total uh, use cases. So we'll now look at image captioning. So first of all, what even is image captioning? Really, this is a process of converting from image to a text. So trying to describe an image using text tokens. In other words, words. Uh, we're just trying to, really, the name is pretty self-explanatory, caption an image. And so I've actually worked on this myself before. Uh, I've created a model for it and you know I've built a little system. And so this photo down here, you see with the dog with, uh, with the little toy in its mouth running across and then the caption that's generated, that's actually what my little um, clunky model is able to generate. Uh, it captioned this image as brown white running across the field or across field. Now obviously that's not a great caption, but considering that I myself did this and not some you know researcher, and I did this in, within like one weekend, um, I think that's pretty incredible. The fact that we're getting this algorithm that's describing this image, and really it's not wrong, right? You've got brown, white, you know, it's a brown, white dog, but running across field. And so that right there, pretty amazing. And the crazy thing is, uh, machine learning techniques can do a lot better than this even. So let's look at how image captioning can actually be done. So possible model and system. So there's obviously many ways, you, uh, as you might think, to do this. There's not only one set way, but let's look at a popular general uh, pipeline or model uh, that's often used. So really, we're looking here at an encoder decoder. So basically, the image is encoded, and as I'm sure many of you know, the most popular way these days to do that is by using a convolutional neural network. So, you know, you can pick your own of choice, your ResNet or your VGG or Inception or whatever or whatever else you prefer to encode your image and then you get your image representation, right? So your feature map that hopefully, as long as you picked a good uh, encoder uh, architecture, your image representation should represent most of the important aspects or attributes about your image. And then you can take your image representation and then you use this technique called teacher forcing. So you take the part of the caption that you already have and then you have your decoder system where you put in your image and you put in your partial caption. And then the decoder uses an RNN to work with your partial caption. Then the decoder also has information about what your image is and then it will predict the next word in your caption and so that's something that's called teacher forcing if you want to look that up if you're curious about learning more but basically here's what's happening we get our image feature fe feature representation we'll just call that our image vector we've got that and then for our decoder system we have to pass it through multiple times so we start with nothing right we don't know what our caption is so we have to have some token to represent that so we'll just say that start so we pass in to our decoder the image and start. And then the decoder will predict the next word. So let's say its prediction is the. Then you pass in your image, then your sentence or your sequence containing start and the, and you pass that in. And then it might predict dog. And then you keep passing that in until it predicts your end token, which is, let's say, end. And then once you get end, then you're like, okay, let me stop passing it into my decoder. Uh, I'll take it out. Uh, I'll take what I have and I'll get rid of the word stop and, and end. And then you've got your caption. And once again, feel free to look up teacher forcing image captioning uh, if you're interested in learning more about the specific details. Uh, but really, you're, when you're training, your uh, inputs to your system are just your image and then partial captions and the target would be the next word. And you train it like that to be able to take a partial caption and an image and predict the next word in the caption. And so um, that's really a basic way that it's done. Now you might be wondering, well, how does the encoder and decoder specifically work? Well, for the encoder, like I said, you've got many options. Uh, for example, VGG, Inception, etc. And uh, for the decoder, you've got many options as well. But 
like I said, R and Ns are mostly used here. And these days, attention, which we've learned about before in this club, is being applied as well for some pretty amazing results. Um, attention, remember, is just a technique that helps you gain more context when working with sequences, especially words and sentences. And so applying that really generates some better results for a captioning as well. And once again, this was a little bit of an overview look at it, so feel free to do some more research and look at our further reading, further, further reading document uh, to learn some more. Okay, so you might be wondering, well, why should we even do this, right? What's the point of image captioning? Well, think about how an image search might work. Um, if a user enters in a, a text token, like, I want to find this, well, then you might have captions for every image in your database. And you take the user's uh, token sequence, what they're looking for, and compare, compare it with the captions. And then the most similar caption, well, the image that correlates to that would be your image that you return to the user. So that's one possible use case. Uh, there's also many more. For example, let's say you want to create detailed explanations of, of images. So think about um, an x-ray and you want to automatically generate a report based on your x-ray. Um, well, you could pass it into a specialized image captioning system that might be able to generate a whole report. And so that's really an area of further research. And who knows, you can definitely at least try doing that yourself as well. Um, and yeah, feel free to discuss more in the chat. You can type out some more ideas that you may have. Um, and if you're not watching this live or d during club time, then feel free to just discuss with yourself. You can move on to visual Q&A. So again, what is visual Q&A or visual question and answering? So visual question and answering is basically to build a model or framework that can respond to any individual question over any given image. Right. So basically, you know, in human life, we always want to, you know, uh, um, um, we always wanted the machine to answer questions. Right. So if you're given an image of, say, a basketball game, you want to say, you know, who has the ball? Um, what score is being played? Who are the teams? Um, you know, what color is the court? You know, how many players are in the image? And the questions like that. And, you know, just by the snap, those machines should be able to answer those questions. And that's basically what visual question and answering is, right? So basically, deep learning along with computer vision and NLP actually have made great strides in, you know, in, in the field of visual question and answering. And let me get a little more, you know, in depth on that. So basically, just to start off, um, you know, it started off, you know, with image question and answering yeah. and then it turned into the name visual question and answering. Right, but it basically started off with the concept of the convolutional neural network or the CNN, right? Because that was you know the mainstream computer vision application at the time, and then basically it just kept going, and um, you know obviously there's pre-trained models on CNN such as VGG and Net, uh, ResNet, and then moving on, but basically I mean like Inception I would say is another another model that was used for visual questioning and answering. So basically, I just want to touch on the fact that, you know, these CNNs have basically, you know, were the, were the layers slash foundation of the visual question and answering, but then it later developed into the RNN, which is the recurrent neural network, right? And that basically, you know, that basically helped the growth of machine text understanding and basically, you know, unlock new levels to machine translation, text classification, and contextual understanding. Um, the other breakthrough in visual question and answering that has gone along with RNNs are the LSTM, which I actually talked about in the lip reading, and that is the long short term memory architecture, you know, which has helped and built on the RNN by introducing a context cell, context cell, excuse me, that stores the prior relevant information in order to answer the questions better. So basically, you know, just to recap. The uh, the CNN, or more specifically the VGG Net, you know the model in CNN and LSTM, basically you know composed the VQA model, the first VQA model, and you know that served as the foundation for many more to come. And so basically, as you know said in the slide, um, you know you know more and more frameworks, your architectures and formulations from mathematical perspectives, uh, basically have you know, have been introduced and have helped the VQA model grow into heights that we've never seen. 
So now I just want to show you basically, you know, the, for the top, the top half, that kind of picture of the timeline is just showing you, um, you know, what, what has happened in the sense of visual question and answering. So you can see there's in, in 2014, the Dakar data set has been introduced, which I'm going to be going to in later depth. And basically you just, you can just see that, you know, this has been different models that have been introduced and basically were introduced from the base of the, you know, just a normal VQA. As in like 2018, you see the NS VQA or 2019, you can see the K VQA. Um, there's just been different types of models have been that have been, you know, coming out as in, you know, in result of the normal VQA model and, you know, just breakthroughs have been coming out and it's been, it's been really nice to see that. So basically, I just wanted to emphasize the bottom image is that would be, you know, an example of what the VQA would do, right? So it would analyze that image, it would analyze the question and based on the question and image, it would provide you a response, right? So you can see in the second slide, um, how many doors are open. It, sh it shows two doors, but only one door is open. So it's gonna say one. Or you can say, where's the oven? On the right side of the refrigerator, which is pretty right. So, you know, it could say on the left side of the dishwasher, I, I could say, but you know, it's giving you the right answer basically. And that's basically what we want the VQA or visual question and answering model to do. So basically, how does computer vision and natural language processing correlate with the visual question and answering models? And I mean, first off, I just want to say it is clear that, you know, VQA frameworks are involving this computer vision because CNNs and then also have the NLP because it needs to understand the question just, you know, in, in basic context. And then also has KR as seen as the KVQA uh, model. And so basically, I just want to, you know, tell you guys or the structure of, you know, the visual question, uh, the, the visual question and answering model. Right, so as seen in the second bullet point, you're gonna see that you know the first step is to obviously extract the features or the relevant features from the question, and then you know so obviously you say, uh, you know how many doors are open? It's gonna say doors open, and then it's gonna correlate those two words together, to, you know, to find it, and then basically the second step is to extract the features from the image, right? So it's going to extract the relevant uh, features from the image. So it's gonna take those two doors. And then it's going to see one of them open. And then basically it's going to combine the features from the question and image to generate an answer, right? So for text features, it's obviously going to take the LSTM, you know. And then for image features, it's going to take the pre-trained images, uh, pre-trained CNNs, I'm sorry. Um, such as VGG, Net, or ResNet, or Inception. And then that basically, um, you know... I basically can go into classification, but that was just combining the question and image with said LSTM and CNN. The goal, I mean, the goal of any VQA is to focus the algorithm, you know, to focus on the most relevant parts of the input, right? So if you're going into, um, if you're going into an image, right, and it has, you know, the relevant information you need, we don't want that model just to go to like the bottom left of the screen and analyze that bottom left because that bottom left most likely might not be relevant to the question itself, right? So you want to train it to use spatial attention to generate region specific features to train CNNs, right? So as stated before, you know, deep learning techniques are, are significantly improving NLP and CV results. And so we can expect, you know, these VQAs to, you know, achieve more accuracy or get more accurate in the, you know, the following years. And, um, you know, there's still s several discussions going on, you know, is, um, are the data sets biased? Actually, I want to go into that. Um, the Dakar data set can actually be seen as the primary data set that is used, right? So that is the first significant VQA data set because the Dakar data set stands for the data set for question answering on real world images, right? So basically, it just uses indoor scenes with lighting conditions to make it difficult to answer questions. And that has gone to an accuracy of 50% or 50.2 to be exact. And they're basically using this model just to train these models. Um, they're basically using this data set to train these models because this is the best known data set to fully train the model. So yeah, that's basically all I have for VQA and thank you for listening. Okay, so now let's look at our final use case, which is image generation.
All right, and uh, when we mention image generation in the context of computer vision plus natural language processing, we're talking about image generation from text. So once again, not just random image generation, but image generation from text. And so one great example of this is a recently, recently released OpenAI DAL-E system, which is one text-to-image uh, generation model. And here you've got some results from their system. So for example, here's a text token. Uh, and by the way, we'll have links to this in our further resources document, so you can go check this out for yourself, this little simulator. But you can plug in this sequence of words, so this sentence, which is an illustration of an avocado with a mustache blowing its nose. And then Dolly will generate many, or I mean, each time you pass it in, it'll generate a different uh, image. But you can see these are some of the ones that it generated. And these are actually pretty great in my opinion. And I think it's pretty surprising that, I mean, most of these are pretty much correct. You've got an avocado with a mustache, and some of these, like this one over here, is indeed blowing its nose. So that's just a quick look at what exactly we mean when we say text to, to, uh, to image. Okay, so how is this even done? Well, like I said, our real goal here is to take a text representation, right? So some way to represent text and convert that into an image. And this is really inverse to image captioning if you think about it, because with image captioning, we're going from image to text. Here we're just going from text to image, the other way around. And so for representations of text, um, I'm sure many of you know that one way that's often done is by using RNNs and the many different flavors of RNNs like LSTMs, bidirectional LSTMs, GRU, uh, etc, etc. So that's for the text representation. And in order for the image generation part, well, predominantly and in the ways that we'll be looking at, GANs are used. Now, I know at TJ Machine Learning Club, we've, we've covered GANs in the past, and in fact, there's a video on it on the channel, so plug to that, go check that out if you haven't ever heard of GANs before. But with that being said, let's look at some models. Okay, so the very basic framework would be to have a generator which will encode your text and then transform that to an image. So let's say you'll have your generator um, get for you, I mean, I mean, if we think about it on a very small scale, you'll have your generator encode your text sequence and then get a 16-dimensional um, re representation, so a vector of length 16, and then your generator could then uh, transform that to output a 4x4 image, let's just say. And then your discriminator would take the text encoding and the image to predict whether it's real or fake, or in this case, incorrect slash correct. Um, is this text caption uh, correct with this image, right? Because that's really the goal. Your discriminator or your discriminator is trying to predict whether or not the pair you give it of text and image is correct. And so you're, you're gonna train your discriminator with real pairs. And then for the fake pairs, you're gonna give it uh, examples of the generator's text and image, right? Because you want it to be able to discriminate between real and fake, so what's generated by the generator and what's not in order to improve your generator. And so that was a lot of talking from me. If that sounds a little bit confusing, that's totally fine. Let's look at a nice visual. So this is a pretty popular way, um, a, a pretty popular model. Once again, if you like to read the actual paper, the link is in the further reading doc. But this is essentially a really baseline, you could say, GAN to go from text to image. And let's just walk through how it works. So it first, takes some random noise, right? Because with your GAN, you want a little bit of stochasticity. You don't want it to give you the same exact um, image for a given text every single time. And if you do, you would take out this random noise. But assuming you want something at least a little bit different every single time, you first have a little bit of random noise. So just drawn from your distribution between zero and one, think of it as a vector or uh, a matrix. And you've got that and you concatenate that to your text representation. And remember, to go from this blue box of, just think of that as your text, in order to go from that to this smaller blue box, you've gotta put it through some type of text encoder um, or embedding, really. Um, so, you know, you can have your pick here with BERT, Word2Vec, or whatever, whatever other text representation you'd like. And then you're just concatenating that little bit of random noise to your text representation. And then, like I said earlier, you have to transform this into your image, right? So you can do this however way you want. Um, the common way to do it really is just upsampling 
Um, so, I mean, if you're a TensorFlow user like me, uh, think of the upsampling 2D layer. Um, so you would upsample, and then you would basically, you know, perform whatever series of transformations you wanted with dense layers, upsampling, whatever, reshaping, and all that to output your image, right? So once again, you're just transforming your random noise plus text representation into the image. And that is the generator's prediction. It's saying here, this is the image that I think should go with this text. And then the discriminator, now once again, remember with GANs, the discriminator's job is to uh, try to detect what's coming from your generator. And then in that way, the generator, I mean, if it's correctly detected by the discriminator, it failed, quote unquote. And then in that way, the generator is forced to improve itself to try to fool the discriminator. And so the discriminator here takes as input the image represented or the image generated from your generator and then it encodes that. So once again, have your pick with however you want to do that, VGG, ResNet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then it takes that encoding and this is an important point here. It takes in a text representation here because you want your discriminator to have context of whether or not um, this image, regardless of whether it's real or fake, matches with the with this you know given label. So the label that you would give to your generator, you then give to your discriminator as well. So essentially, you've got a representation of your image and the text that supposedly fits with that image, and then your generator or your discriminator will use that to predict whether or not it's real or fake, uh, or correct or incorrect. Um, and you would hope that a good discriminator would. Uh, predict incorrect slash fake for an image pair from the generator and in that way the generator is forced to improve itself and then you've got all your all your uh, additional inf information about GANs um, but th that's the general idea there uh, we can read this little caption down here our text conditional convolutional GAN architecture and once again the important point the text encoding is used by both the generator and discriminator uh, it's projected to lower dimensions and depth concatenated with image feature maps for further stages of, of convolutional processing. So that's a pretty great model right there. I think um, it's less complicated than you know it could have been, so that's good. I hope from that you're able to get a basic idea of how a system like this might work. And once again, feel free to check out the further reading doc, which I'll link to at the end here. All right, so let's just look at one more model for how text generation or image generation from text would work. So here, this is stack GAN. Uh, and it might look complicated at first, but really all it's doing is first generating a somewhat correct, hopefully somewhat correct uh, image from your text. And then it's upsampling that with yet another GAN to make it more realistic or to make it you know, better quality. So we can split up stack GAN into stage one and stage two. So in stage one, uh, it's taking some encoding of the text. So once again, you've got an embedding there. And then it's doing conditioning augmentation. And really, that's just further processing it and adding in some stochasticity. So once again, that's where your random noise comes in. So just think of it's taking your embedding or your text representation and adding in some random noise just so you get a, di a, a different result yeah, each time. And then it is trying to upsample that into your image. So right, you're going from text description and a little bit of randomness, and then it's transforming that to your image. And then you've got the discriminator here again that is hoping to make the generator better. Uh, it also will predict whether your text plus image is correct or incorrect. And once again, the whole goal of that is to improve the generator. Because if the generator gets caught, you could say, um, then it'll have to improve itself. Um, and so that's where you've got the embedding, right, going to the, the discriminator here as well. And then it'll just predict whether uh, it's correct slash incorrect or real or fake. And then your stage two um, with the generator and discriminator, it's pretty much um, kind of your standard GAN. But the whole idea here is to uh, upscale or you could say just improve the image from your stage one. So the stage two will just take the stage one images and then it'll try upsampling that. Um, and then once you've got your stage two discriminator also, which will just predict real or fake. And so there are many uh, upsampling GANs out there. You can just insert your favorite one uh, into here. So I'm not gonna go too in depth into this one for the hope or for the uh, thought of time. I, do, I know we do have some time constraints, but just, just know that the stage one GAN, it's there to generate your image. Stage two GAN, it's there to try to make your image better. 
and this is the stack GAN architecture. There are many variants of this, like stack GAN++. Uh, I won't go into all that here today, but hopefully once again, you're able to get a basic idea uh, of how this works. Okay, so that's about it for our presentation. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. Uh, if you wanna look at the further reading and resources doc, which I really encourage you all to do, then head, out, or then head on over to tinyurl.com slash cv-nlp-further. Once again, here's a link. Feel free to check that out. Uh, let Sachin or me know if you have any questions. And yeah, thank you for watching.